Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Jacques. Uh, I work at Google. I work on uh, ML compilers and, and different deployment tooling. Um, and today, you know, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about like enabling composition of kernels and compilers. You know, some of the work we've been doing with, with like different compiler projects at Google. So a lot of the talk is actually going to be, you know, talking a little bit about MLIR. MLIR is a collection of modular and reusable software components that enable the progressive lowering of high-level operations to efficiently target hardware uh, in a common way. So this is uh, a, a toolkit that we use in many of our different projects and deployment scenarios. Uh, it is a compiler toolkit in general, not ML specific, you know, used in many different domains. But today I'll, I'll focus on like the, the, the ML section of the world um, because, well, that, that's a, a big section to begin with. Um, so I sort of, when preparing for this talk, I, I look back at actually like the very first slide we made about MLIR ever. So this is like back in 2018, you know, we had this goal slide where we said like what do you want to do. So at this point we were building uh, some optimization infra for, for TensorFlow. We were redoing the graph infrastructure part. And, and the one part that sort of like stood out to me is like we had, well, we slash I had a section about like customization, you know, the ability to be able to intermix different components, the ability to be able to, to customize the compilation process as well as enable more ef efficient targeting of these, um, of these systems. Now, one of the funny things that has happened since then, MLIR was released, it's been in the industry, it's adopted at many different companies, and you know, I've actually had the same conversation with multiple different folks at different companies where you know, they would come to me and say like, you know, uh, you know, like MLIR has been useful, but it, it's, it's been a little bit problematic because we used to have a, a compiler team and we used to have a library team. Now both folks are working on, on, on MLIR and, and it's getting a little bit fuzzy who's supposed to be doing what. Um, you know, because we have library team writing generators for the kernels that are using MLIR, the, the Python bindings and whatnot, the high level optimizations as, as a toolbox to write some of these kernels. But we have we have also have the compiler team, you know, using uh, you know incorporating kernels as well as microkernels, you know. So like tongue in cheek, you know, is it the success if the project causes reorgs in other organizations? Maybe, um, but you know, it could also just be like I think in in a composable uh, compiler pipeline with modular components, this line just naturally gets blurry, you know. Like it, it, there, there is the uh, like a, a common utility as well as like benefit of using these technologies. Now, there's no silver bullet to solving this tension between like should we use libraries, should we, you know, what should we use where, to what extent, how much human, how much, you know, how much automatic, how much do we search, and whatnot. So I mean, MLIR provides all the infrastructure to build IR and transformations, uh, but and it makes it easy to iterate on IR design and try different things out. But composability is still the key, right? So th there's a big human design component on it. Uh, composability is never perfect. You know, assembling entire tool chains is still work, you know, and there's a lot of design that actually goes into these deep learning compilers to get good performance and to ensure, you know, you have a predictable uh, loading path that gives you good performance. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of, you know, uh, where we, we've sort of like tried to, well, we and others have incorporated like some of these ideas and, and sort of like mixed you know, like kernels as well as, as like compilers to try and get like better performance and, and some of the things that you know, worked and didn't work. You know, and one example, we, we, were, we had a folks looking at an ear compiled module. So you have a model, they were compiling it down and they were looking and they were trying to improve performance, right? So they did the performance analysis, they, they did their histograms, they identified the most computationally intensive ops, they, they found a high performance library that has these exact same ops. You know, and folks got quite excited because they found that the kernels were actually 4x faster than the generated one. So it's like, this is awesome, right? We have 4x higher kernels, we can just slap it in. It's the most expensive op, so this, this should go awesome. Uh, except, of course, reality is after a couple of weeks of integration and tuning, the end-to-end the -end results was actually 29% worse, right? So like incorporating this high-performance kernel for the most computationally intensive part ended up in degrading the performance of the model quite significantly. Now, why is this? Well, for one, it, it blocked the compiler's ability to optimize. You know, it, it, by, by using this kernel for, for these operations, it, it, it disabled the ability to do fusions. It broke up tiling, so now suddenly you have additional synchronization, you have additional transfers, uh, additional uh, uh, serialization in the process. A lot of these kernel libraries are actually written assuming they are the entire system. 
You know, so for example, in this case, th this one is made internal copies of all the data before it operated on it. Uh, and this meant like additional copies that was not, not required. Also, they're written assuming they control everything. So the, the way they've been tuned and finally optimized, you know, uh, it, it, it's, 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 I think, a very delicate balance to, to get like the exact utilization by considering like, the, the threading, the read-write ports of the instruction dispatch, et cetera, et cetera. Now, by incorporating this and, and being part of a system, you actually destroyed some of the assumptions that have been made about locality. And then also, very importantly, the execution model, there was a mismatch between what the system was doing and the compiler was generating and what these libraries were doing, right? So the, these libraries were being inserted where single-threaded functions were being generated normally. Because the execution model is sort of, was sort of similar to how you would do with a GPU, multiple threads, everyone SMD style execution wise. Um, and anybody who has used like nested parallelism sort of can attest that it gets very tricky very quickly. Now, what's one of the solutions? I mean, uh, there's of course many, you know, and one of them is like actually microkernels, something that incorporates better with the compiler. You know, and as a disclaimer, everybody claims to have microkernels and nobody can agree what they are or the granularity that it is. You know, we had one discussion where somebody said, oh, well, no, we have a microkernel. You guys actually have nanokernels. You know, so like it's, it's what it is. But, uh, and I mean, on the right, you know, the go-to class, like classical example, represented like in the, in the bliss formalism, where I go down to like the little microkernel as well. Uh, in, in, in short, you know, the way I think about it is like highly optimized building blocks to use in multiple different kernels, cogen to produce optimized kernels or operations. Right, so these are things that could actually have been intrinsics, high level intrinsics, or even hardware units. And importantly, they can also stand in for hardware units. So this is a thing where like, a system where you have microkernels in your design, like when you're trying to target new hardware, you, know, you can use the, this microkernel initially, make your compiler pipeline target it, and then if it's able to target well, then hopefully by the time it, you have your hardware unit back, it's a simple switch, because it's just like a one-to-one -one flip there. Um, like I said, there's a couple of reasons why it avoids solving the hard problem generally. You know, perfectly scheduling all these instructions at a low level is quite difficult. Having a user write a couple by hand and tuning, you know, very aggressively is quite easy. Uh, new ISAs come out. Compilers can necessarily evolve as quickly as, uh, you know, as some of the models or the adaptability. You know, it's not really a thing to go and hack the ISAL instruction selection of a compiler, right? There's huge implications, but changing a microkernel or specializing for one is quite easy. Uh, also, there's many folks that can write C, fewer folks that can write compilers, so like being able to ex enable folks to do both, uh, we have the C and intrinsic skills to do this, I think is quite useful. And then it's a stepping stone to cogent, to figuring out what you need in general. Now, at Erie, in the level, it's sort of like at the register level, you know, this actually enables the, the, like the fusion together, uh, both the fusion and granularity, sorry, an execution granularity sort of match. It makes it easy to co-optimize and schedule and run. And, you know, you can think of this as just high-level intrinsics, and the compiler has to support it anyway, so it's sort of like a natural fit in the system. And the performance results or improvements from utilizing them is actually quite good. Now, I mentioned that, you know, for a lot of the, the work, you know, you actually need to be able to write intrinsics, write the assembly, you know, and, and one of the things that has been happening like in, 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 uh, in TPUs is the ability to write some custom TPU kernels. Now, historically, XLA was very clear, like HLOs are the set of ops. Goal is to en enable portability as well as a decreased compiler developer space and support, right? Make it more maintainable, make it easier by constraining the op offset. Uh, you know, fallback custom kernels were initially introduced as a fallback, you know, hold to world kind of thing, right? If you use them, your performance degrades, it's your, you accept it. But I think like the requirements have changed as the ML models have changed, and you know, this means support for custom kernels, uh, you know, has been felt more and more. And you know, I, I think it's, it's not just in, in OpenXLA, but also in PyTorch. A lot of these same discussions have been happening, as seen from some of the, the posts. Uh, now, in, in JAX itself, you know, the, the way these have been introduced is sort of like you have Palace as a high-level language that lowers it, it down and, and is able to target these things. Mosaic TPU is this lower level format. It's not JAX specific. It's a Python interface. Uh, effectively, it's, it's like syntactic sugar on the generate MLR Python bindings. You know, folks that know, think of like sort of like memrev vector and a rough level. It's low level assembly. 
uh, which is good. It means you have full customer, well, it's good or, and or bad, depending on how you use it, right? But this gives you the op opportunity to actually do some very low-level detailed things. Um, and, you know, I think it's one where, you know, it's been uh, adopted quite widely internally. And, you know, it's actually succeeded where multiple previous approaches have actually failed. And one of the reasons why is it, it just it does not fight against the compiler. It was designed to fit the constraints of the existing pipeline. It, it, it had considerations made as well as ongoing improvements to increase the blurring between what is custom and what is not. Um, and also, it doesn't actually re-implement parts of the compiler. It utilizes the, the, the compiler passes and infrastructure. So it, 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 it's actually beautiful feeding back into one another uh, in terms of being able to increase the compiler while working into it. So sort of as summary, and as <laughs> the lightning talk comes to a lightning end, you know, uh, you know, compilers versus kernels is sort of a false dichotomy. You know, it, it, it's, uh, folks often will say it is, but uh, you know, I, I think once one digs a little bit deeper, it, it, these are two essential components to being able to produce optimized performance for the MM workloads and deployments. You know, and we actually get better results by utilizing the strengths of both and combining them together. Thank you.